Welcome to the Future is Borderless podcast with David Nilsson. We feature top entrepreneurs and thought leaders from around the world, those who bring a global mindset and a unique perspective to their life and business. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, I'm David Nilsson. I'm the host of your show. Uh, on this podcast, we connect with um, amazing entrepreneurs and thought leaders. Uh, people from around the world who have what I like to call as a borderless mindset. And we're looking to bring visibility into new ideas, uh, new innovations and best practices, things that can be applied to both your personal and professional life. And that will help us move forward in a, a fast moving world. Now, uh, today's episode is brought to you by Docs of Talent. Docs of Talent helps business leaders to find full-time, dedicated, highly skilled workers from around the world. And this includes everything from accountants to executive assistants, sales development reps, software engineers, and many others. And as a result of building an offshore capability, these companies can scale faster, increase margin, and improve culture. To learn more about Doxa, you can visit their website at doxatalent.com. All right, I'm actually really excited for today. Um, I've invited somebody onto the show that has been a big part of my entrepreneurial journey. I'll tell you a little bit about that, but first let me just introduce Dave uh, Parker, who is a five-time founder, and he's been through uh, over 15 exits as a founder, uh, an operator, a member, and an advisor. And he splits his time between um, helping to fund early stage companies and then helping to exit them. He's a senior partner at Fearless Fund, which is focused on investing in women of color across the U.S. in consumer and tech companies. And on the other end of the spectrum, he's helping founders exit their company through Next Path, excuse me, Next Path Advisors. But he also wrote a book called Trajectory, uh, and it's, you know, they put a colon there and then there's startup. So it's trajectory and the first iteration of startup, and it's from ideation to product market fit. And uh, he's a Seattle entrepreneur who's been a highly ranked mentor with Techstars and uh, Flat Six Labs, 500 Startups, Founders Institute, and so on. And he's traveled the world sort of investing in accelerator programs from Brazil to Singapore, uh, Budapest, and many other places. Now, on a more personal note, I've known Dave uh, since I think 2004, uh, shortly after I started a company called Guidant Financial, and he ended up being on our board for 15 years. So unlike many of my guests, I actually know him very, very well. Um, however, throughout the pandemic and then having two kids, relocating my family and now starting Docs at Talent, we haven't been in as, as much in contact. And so I'm really excited to dig into some of the projects that he's got going on. So with all of that, Dave, welcome to The Future is Borderless. Oh, awesome. Thanks for having me. It's it's fun to catch up for any reason. So let alone talking about topics that we both love. So that's that part's fun, but it's always good to see you, my friend. Likewise, likewise. Well, let, I want to talk about your book for a second. Um, sure. And for those of you that that have not yet read it, it's called Trajectory Startup. Uh, it's called Ideation uh, to Product Market Fit. You know, the book is, I think, there to help early stage founders understand what they need to learn and test before they quit their day job. Uh, and I'm just curious, like, what inspired you to write the book? Oh, my gosh. So e easy on a couple of fronts. So I had the chance after working, doing my own startups and and being interim CEO and some at various gigs right over time. And I had a chance to work for a nonprofit. There was a global nonprofit that you, some folks will recognize as Startup Weekend. Mm. And Startup Weekend, uh, my last full year there, we did 1,265 events worldwide, 120 countries, 460 cities. Can you guess I was the chief operating officer at the time based on the data? <laughs> and 74,000 attendees. So I got to join a movement in progress, which was amazing. Uh, Mark Nogger and the team, and, and uh, I think when I joined the team, David, the average age of the team was 27. So I single-handedly brought the average up. Yes, um, and we went from 500 events a year to 1,200 events in two years in the time I was there. Because it was really focused on how do we scale it? Right. And as a nonprofit, um, we ended up selling the company to Techstars uh, in 2015. So from that experience and post Techstars and Global Accelerator Network and a bunch of other work I've had a chance to do, I've had a chance to visit uh, 22 countries for startups, total of 34 countries total, which for a kid to grow up in a small town in southwestern Washington, it's, it's definitely a, a bit of my badge of honor. I'm not done yet. I'm kind of like, if it's an interesting place to go that I get invited to, I'm totally in. So, but that was the big piece is people would come out of Startup Weekend and they're like, I met David, we're like co-founders, soulmates, I'm going to leave my day. I'm like, oh my God, no. Like before <laughs> you leave your day job, there are some things you can know and things you can test. Yeah. And especially for product companies, right? It's a little bit different than a service company. A service company, 
the, the concept of product market fit doesn't really apply because other people are buying services. They're just buying them from somebody else. And why will they buy them from you? But for a product company, this concept of product market fit is for some, for some, especially VCs, because there's the, the world I, I sit partially in today. Um, for VCs, they're like, well, we'll know it when we see it. I'm like, no, it's math. It's not pornography, right? It's not a, it's just, just, it's just math. And it seemed to be so weird for some people to be like, oh no, it's not. Like it's, it's not. It's actually just five things. So here's the, like, if you if you drop the podcast after this and you're like, I'm gonna hit, I'm gonna hit these five things real quick so you know what the math is. The math is a trend math in five areas. Is the traffic at the top of my site going up? Yes or no? Is the number of leads every month or demos, if you're doing a product demo, right? Are those number of leads and demos going up? Are the number of customers going up? Is my time to close going down? And is my annual contract value going up? If I have one or two of those things, it's exciting. Like, congratulations, you're on your way to product market fit. If you have those five things, you have the miracle of compound interest. Like that is the, now, are there more things later? Of course there are like special things that you wanna measure just for your business. The answer is sure. But those five things are prescriptive. Like they apply to every business, especially every product business and predominantly tech. So I, I definitely lean tech and lean product. The concept there of product market fit is not, it's the, the point of the book is it's not a mystery, right? You can go find it. But there's, as you know, I mean, you've been around a bunch of startups too. Doing a startup, there's a thousand things that can kill you, oh, right? Yeah. So you need to focus on the few things that you can get you to the next level. And so this book is really focused ideation to product market fit. Uh, the next book is called Trajectory Scale Up. It's product market fit to exit. Like things that you and I know from time together in, in 15 years, like I originally wrote a chapter on how to run a board meeting, right? Or having great culture. And the answer is, if you don't have product market fit, that doesn't actually matter because <laughs> you're you're dead or you have a nonprofit, right? So I, I took that content and said like, it actually doesn't matter. Like the only milestone for a startup is how do I get the product market fit? If you get from zero to 1 million, right? You, you Congratulations. Yeah. Going from 1 million to 10 million, whole different set of challenges, right? But as I always remind founders in the early stage, like you don't have culture. Like if you and I started a company, we would have personalities. The investors would either like our personalities or not like our personalities. But culture is not something you and I are going to go and go do an offsite as co-founders early and say, like, we need to set the culture of our company. Now, if you're a services business, I would say culture is a competitive advantage. But again, you don't have a product market fit issue. So that's that's why I wrote the book. And that was the audience. And it led to a really interesting set of, you know, ending up in Budapest and, and Taiwan and China and all things for startups, which was super fascinating. Well, it turns out these are these are issues that in, that every entrepreneur, regardless of geography, uh, have to deal with, right? So, I, I, I'm actually glad you wrote it. I remember years ago when I started Guiden Financial, and we were talking to entrepreneurs every single day. Now, uh, not there anymore, obviously, but every time we would talk to an entrepreneur, you know, the questions they would ask are, uh, "What book can I read to see if my idea is the right idea?" or "What book can I read to see if I'm even an entrepreneur?" You can find books on how to be a great manager, how to build culture, uh, but there was very, very little uh, in terms of references that we could give them in terms of thinking about those things. So glad you wrote it. Now, inside the book, though, there are a couple of pieces that that uh, stood out to me that I wanted to just sort of call out. Um, one of the lessons is around what I what you call, I should say, is awkward co-founder co-founder discussions. Yep. Um, I I have started every business I've ever been a part of with a co-founder, so I am really curious to hear sort of your take on this. Well, the, the way I set it up in the book and the, the section, and by the way, some of this started with um, on my blog, I, I wrote about 160 blog posts and I came back at one point and I'm like, oh my God, that's a chapter. Yeah, that was just me ranting about something, right? Um, you know, the maturity changed over time for sure. But um, I, I get these prompts and doing office hours and I'm like, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm just going to write about it. And then when somebody has this issue, I'm like, go read the blog. Like, I want to talk about something interesting for me. Not always the best way to handle your customer, but the office hours are typically for you, right? So it's a two-step process, right? The step one is to sit down with your co-founder and have a discussion about phase of life, time of life. Because, you know, the business in some ways, it's, its most beautiful moment is the moment you've incorporated, right? It's rainbows and butterflies and unicorn farts. It's amazing. The business is all forward-looking. Everything's amazing. 
and then you have to make payroll and you know healthcare benefits and right so it's, it's kind of like the peak moment and then a trough of despair and then hopefully you get to the end and everybody's still happy and you love each other so phase one is just to have a conversation about is this a good time in life and those things and we're sitting having that discussion right then you go to a review process. The review process takes you to a site called Founders, F-O-U-N-D-R-S. Um, there's no the F-O-U-N-D, yeah, R-S versus E-R-S. And it was it was built by um, a VC in, in Los Angeles. And you basically put in, there's, there's room for four co-founders at the top, and you put in, you click on a series of buttons, circles or squares around, who's going to do this? Oh, you're going to be the CEO. Who's going to run the product? Oh, I want to be CTO. Whose idea was it, right? And that's, that can only be one person's idea. So you go through this checklist and you get to the end and you hit the calculate button and boom, it tells you what your equity split should be. Oh, wow. So you print that out and you bring it to the second meeting. And it's a little bit like liar's poker, right? But instead of this way, you, you, you throw it down on the table in front of you and you're both like, oh, I thought I was going to do that. Oh, I thought, but it was my idea. Yeah. So it, it has this forcing function of like, do we, are we both? You know, how do we feel about it? Like you're 67% and I'm the balance. And I felt like maybe I should be 50-50. Mm. My point is, is 50-50, I think is the only wrong option, right? Because it, it says, and I know you guys have, you guys were 50-50 guy forever, which is an anomaly for sure, right? Mm. Um, so, but generally it means, at least from an investor perspective, that you took the first hard decision you had to make and you decided to kick the can. That's usually what it means. So, and I don't care if it's 50 point, one and 49.9 it's more just a matter of at some point that you were willing to take on the hard disc the hard discussion so that's the forcing function i've used it a bunch of times um the only one time it didn't work it was an interesting um father son um trio or father son and they asked me to come on as an advisor i've known the father a long time and the son i always appreciated and uh he didn't he didn't print it out and he's like, oh, I didn't have time. I'm like, you just didn't like what it said. Yeah. <laughs> right. He's like, well, he's going to get my stock anyway when I die. I'm like, not the point. Right. So the point was, is to have the discussion before, um, because then you end up having discussions around like, well, if I'm, you know, if we're 65, 35 and the company needs $10,000, I'm going to put in 6,500 and you're going to put in 3,500. Right. Yeah. So I know one of my 50 fifties, the only 50 50 I did, by the way, um, in order for my co-founder to take a check out, I had to put a check in. And I'm like, well, then how does that change the, the equity? And he was like, well, why would it change the equity? We've already decided on that. And the answer was, that's why you have the, that's why you have the awkward co-founder discussions early rather than later. Yeah. I'm a big fan of having hard conversations before they're actually hard. Um, although the example, they never get easier. I was going to say the never. example you gave was actually not an easy one. And I, even, even as a guy who's had uh, built and an operated a very successful company with a 50 50 partner, I would never recommend it because in the times that things do get difficult to your point, somebody has to be able to make a decision. And when you're 50 50, sometimes uh, that's not, uh, not possible. So yeah, totally. <laughs> I love it. Well, Hey, let's talk about raising capital for a second, because uh, it was, mm -hmm. you know, obviously it's brought up in the book many, many times. Um, but there was something that you, you said that actually stood out to me and you talked about what, what I think you called it zombie startups. It's the, mm -hmm. they, they're, they're operating, but they don't have enough capital to really continue at the rate that they, they need to, they can't actually raise capital. And I, when I read that, I thought, you know what, I'll bet more startups fall into this category than, uh, people actually assume. And so just curious, uh, what would you say to somebody in that place? Yeah. So, so let me define it first, cause I think it makes sense for people if, if they want to Google uh, venture power curve, right? You'll see, you'll see this, you know, X, Y axis and the returns are here and then it goes on the long tail, right? So the concept of venture power curve is, so in the, in the fund I'm with now, we have 30-ish companies. So we'll go with 30 because the math is easy. So the top decile of those companies will return the fund, right? So fund one was 26. We're working on fund two, it's going to be 150. We want the top three of those 30 companies to return north of $26 million. Like if you're going to return the fund. So that's my top decile. My top quartile sands those top three. So my top 25% is going to create returns, but they won't return the fund, right? So the, that that quarter of those businesses will, will and the return could be 1.2 times, 2.2 times, whatever, but they may even be as high as 10 times, but they're not going to return the fund. So that leaves me with my bottom three quartiles. So the bottom quartile is easy. They just die, right? They vaporize super fast is the general venture math. Not been true in our case so far because our fund has a little bit different thesis. We invest in only of 
only in women of color founded companies. So that category is the most founded per capita, the least funded per capita as a category. So, so far in the first three years of, of that fund, we haven't lost any of them yet. Um, recession coming, some bad business models, right? There'll, there'll be some for sure. But my observation there is that, that because that group has had so little funding, they're scrappier than other groups. So just mm -hmm. outside observation, super interesting to see how the data comes out as the fund matures. We're four years into a 10 years thesis there. So the challenge then is I've got the top 25% gets returned, the bottom 25% gets vaporized. What happens to the middle 50%? We're talking about half the companies. Mm -hmm. So half the companies don't have enough momentum in the, the sell side of the business. We think of this as a, a rule of 50, right? They have 50% growth or 25% growth and 25% profitability. So most of these companies are growing eh, a little bit, but they're not growing. They're not north of 50% growth. Yeah. So they're not sellable, right? And they're not doubling every year. So they're not really venture scale, but they've taken money from investors, friends and family, right? And they're like, we can't shut it down. So where you end up is in zombie land, right? Which is, I don't have access to capital. I can't really sell the company. I can't, I feel a moral obligation to not close it for my employees and probably for my investors. And I totally get that. I've, I've done that too. Um, that is probably the eight years of my life I would like to have back, right? Because the answer was not a great outcome. And, and in retrospect, you knew it wasn't a great outcome. Those founders, David, I would rather they kill the idea and come back and ask for funding again, because the, so this is one of the common things in venture, right? Venture is so driven by uh, tweets. It's crazy, right? And there's what, and people will quote them often. And one of my favorite, least favorite, or my favorite one to mock is the idea doesn't matter. Only execution matters. Now, there's a big assumption there. The assumption is it's a good idea. Right. So yeah. it's like, okay, well, if it's a big idea, sure. Right. The execution only matters. There's not a lot of big ideas, right? There's not a lot of billion dollar ideas. There's a lot of small ideas and there's a lot of ideas for tools. Um, there's a lot of niche ideas, right? But not every deal, not every idea is a unicorn. Right. And the idea there is like, oh, well, it's only execution matters. I'm like, there's lots of things that people say in the, venture land that I always I laugh about as an operator because you're like, that's just BS. That's just crazy. <laughs> I think they missed two key pieces there. It's a good idea, great execution, and a little bit of luck. So yeah, the luck <laughs> is part of it. I always tell people there's a, there's a the, the formula here is um you got to have a great market first. So I, when I started writing the book, I was like, oh my God, it's the team. After and I had this weird quirk I did the two years before I finished the book because I read 100 books a year for those two years. And not, a, not something I would recommend for people who have a life because you don't, if you do 100 books a year, the answer is yes, Audible at 1.8 times speed. Yes, eBooks. Yes, Kindles. Yes, physical books. You have to do all of them to get to 100. And the, the big takeaway in that whole process was you have to be fast to learn and assimilate data and information. The same thing is true in a startup. Yeah. Right? So... When I started that, I was like, you know, so-and-so said team first, um, so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. And after reading and refreshing on all of them, I, I walked away from a, synthesizing that piece of it and said, you know, it's really 1A and 1B. It, 1A is the market. If it's a great and interesting market, maybe even a nascent market, it's, it's brand new. So think Airbnb or, or Uber from that perspective. If it's a great market, a mediocre team can still get an amazing result. But if it's an amazing team in a bad market, they will still have a mediocre result or fail. So 1A and 1B became market first, team second. Number three then was product. Is it super sticky and new customers love it? And number four was traction. What are the early indications that customers care about it? That gets to the five-point formula around product market fit. Yep. Yep. What, let's. Um, I want to drill into one other piece, and then I want to talk a little bit about some of the other projects that you have going on. Um, sure. Pricing. I mean, you. you oh. One of the the big things is there's 14 pricing models um, that you sort of uh, put in the book. You know, I will say after 20 years of being a CEO uh, and now having started a yet another one, you know, pricing is always a really complicated um, component. Like, how are you going to, how are you going to charge for your services? What's the margin look like? So on and so forth. But I'm just curious when you look at the pricing models that you kind of, that you set out in the book, which one do you think is used most often? And, and I'm actually really curious, which one is most underutilized? 
Oh, interesting question. So um, let me, I'll, I'll pull back up a level and explain kind of the thing. So the nomenclature gets set for people. So there's there's the thing, the concept of a business model. Yeah. The business model has three big buckets of components, right? So the first big bucket is what is the product or service you're delivering and how much does it cost to either make it or deliver it, yep. right? So that's the first big bucket. So that's your team, that's engineering, that's support, right? It's all about what does it cost to make and deliver the product? So that's bucket number one. Bucket number two is your cost um, to deliver, right? So in, in that case, it's the it's monetization, right? So how you what's your revenue model? There's 14 revenue models. Some are better than others, right? So what's your pricing, right? And by the way, pricing and promotion are different. Remember the three Ps back from MBA school, business school, right? Product, promotion, and price. So pricing is different than promotion. Like freemium is a promotion. Subscription is a price. Cloud is a delivery model, right? So SaaS is funny because there's a bunch of SaaS products that are free. SaaS isn't actually a revenue model. Subscription is a revenue model. Or uh, Twilio is a great example, or AWS is a great example of metered services. So how you monetize is all about your revenue model. So bucket number one, it's cost to build it. Bucket number two is cost to sell it. So price, revenue model, marketing, and sales. How much is, when I put all those pieces together, what does it cost me to sell the product and what can I do in promotion and pricing to adjust those things accordingly. So if you understand those as the big buckets, because a lot of people are like, well, that's in my business model. I'm like, awesome. Which part of your business model is it in? Right. So, and I'm geeky about price and conversion metrics and unit economics because the the background on the book is we somebody asked me for my financial model and I went to Crunchbase and it was like, you can have mine, but mine's a subscription and yours is a marketplace. And those are kind of fundamentally different. Your B2C, mine's B2B. So we pulled a data set from Crunchbase at the time of 2,600 companies. And then it, because it took me so long to write the book, it, it turned into a five-year longitudinal study of which companies were successful and which ones failed. And we ended up with, there's 14 revenue models and there's a significant amount of learnings in that. But about a third of the book is dedicated to how do you monetize? Long way to answer your other, the short question, which is I think underrated um, lead gen is a really interesting one because it's a way to be super scrappy and um, bootstrap a company. Or productizing a service is another way to be super scrappy and not ever require. So service business is different than productize a service. Like Guidant is an example of productizing a service. Yeah. So there's people and technology there, but the customer is buying an outcome, right? A fixed price and an outcome. They don't care if there's people involved or technology involved. They just want the outcome. Southwest Airlines would be another example. I'm not paying $1.87 to clean my chair. I'm paying you know, $387 to fly from Seattle to wherever. So I, I think those ones are ones because they are easier to bootstrap, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what we discovered after the book was I was working for a family office in a hedge fund managing their venture fund. And what we discovered was the valuation differences in my original table that's in the book and the actual valuation differences are meaningfully different. So like a even post sell-off, take a company like DocuSign. DocuSign trades for... 14, 15 times trailing 12. So they're a, a highly tuned subscription-based company. Groupon, who some people probably remember because it was a new business model at the time, it actually is just lead gen plus commerce. They trade at about 0.37 times trailing 12. So part of that is it's transactional revenue. It's not subscription or recurring. Yeah. When revenue goes up, it's super spiky. Then it goes down. So that it's not the only thing that impacts the enterprise value for sure. But it is a thing that impacts enterprise value um, disproportionately. So and if you looked at, so we pulled together a group of 240 publicly traded stocks across the globe and looked at them based on revenue model. And sure enough, um, things like AWS or Azure, which are metered services companies, which is the more you use, the more you pay, those companies are disproportionately valued compared to companies like service companies like Dell or hardware companies or folks that are further down the stack. So. If you have a choice, if you're a listener and you're like, I want to choose a business model, I would choose the revenue model that has the highest returns. So if you have a choice, you don't always have a choice, right? So your your customer ultimately dictates how they will buy. Yeah, fair point. You've uh, traveled, you said this a minute ago, I think you said 34, 35 countries? 34 countries. Yeah, yeah. but 22 of them were specific to running programs and, and working with startups, right? Yeah. So how, I mean, if you think about fundraising capital, how... How does it 
Is there a major difference in your opinion between geography and the access to capital? And then how has that shifted now that COVID is sort of flattened the world as I like to call it? Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's a, it's a great question. Um, well, let me, let me point out a couple of similarities first. Everywhere I go in the world and you show up in a room of a hundred entrepreneurs, right? And you know this from being around EO and right. You're around a hundred entrepreneurs and everybody knows the math says 70 to 90% of these startups are going to fail. Everybody knows the math and everybody knows it's not them, <laughs> right? They look around the room and like, I'm bad for you. I'm sorry for you guys. Like, cause I know I'm going to succeed. Mm. So the commonality there is, and of course, three to 4% of people are just plain delusional, like completely off the hook delusional, right? Um, if only they had a, a name tag color badge that was different, it would be so much helpful. So number one, I love being around my tribe because that's wherever I go, whatever language they speak and whatever we look like, that is, that's my tribe, right? I just, I love that about it. And they want to change the world and they want to create jobs. And so that part is always fun. So specific to your question, it's interesting. We, we ran a report pre-COVID. We were thinking about doing kind of an arbitrage-based fund that would would basically look at how does this market compare to that market around similar stage and traction companies, right? So, and the it was a pitch book data set that we ran. And we looked at Seattle as a benchmark of 100%. And we said, well, what's, you know, New York and Silicon Valley and Kansas City? And basically, if Seattle was 100%, the Valley at the time was about 184%, and New York was 163%. And Kansas City was uh, 87%. So basically, if it was a Series A deal, so we looked at all the funding for pre-seed, all the funding for seed, all the funding for uh, Series A, Series B, and said, here are the averages based on geography, which, by the way, is interpreted as access to capital. There's, you know, the Kansas City is a nice place. You know, summer's a little hotter than Seattle, right? So but it has nothing to do with anything other than access to capital. And those deltas were pretty meaningful. Yeah. Now, then we did it with MENA, right? Now there's a couple of weird outliers like in New Zealand of companies that had massive fundings, right? But in general, when you took out some of the weird outliers, MENA was like 22%. So you could invest in a series A traction company in the Middle East and North Africa. So Cairo, um, you know, UAE, Dubai, et cetera, for 22 cents on the dollar of a company in Seattle. So that's just that's just access to capital. Is it quality of entrepreneurs? Is it, it and the answer is not really, right? I mean the, the the innovators are innovators are everywhere. Capital is not. Yeah. Now I think the thing that will change post COVID is I think money is more portable than it's ever been. And with Zoom meetings, I don't feel like I have to do I have to really go to sit in your board meeting in person or can I zoom in right on it as well? So um yeah, I think in the last three years, I've trained almost 600 entrepreneurs in the Middle East and North Africa. And I would tell you, it's access to capital. They have a they have an emerging tech ecosystem. It's very much like what I saw in Seattle when I first started my first company in 98, right? There wasn't a people, we, we all complain about the same thing. All the angel investors here, all the VC investors here, right? But the fact is, is that YC and 500 startups and tech stars have really created a common um, set of documents that are open sourced, you know, the, the YC safe document oh, yeah. uh, makes tons of sense, right? Some investors don't get it yet. And the further you are, you further away you are from the Valley, the, the more angel investors don't really understand it, but, um, that's really normalized. A lot of things that, um, very much if the parallel would be in my first startup, we had racks and racks of servers. And today I would rent all of that on AWS for $600 a month. So that AWS has caused the price point required to start a startup to go down. The same thing is true with the YC safe docs, yeah. right? Instead of needing $40,000 to do a private placement memorandum, I can download it and have my lawyer customize it and, you know, get the funding done for less than three or $4,000. Yeah. It's funny that you even bring that up. The last probably half a dozen deals that I've seen have all been safe structures. So um, interesting. Well, uh, lots of good talk. reasons for that too. Yeah. Well, let's talk, let's talk about uh, next path for a second. So you're mm -hmm. helping entrepreneurs exit their business. Um, and I, it's funny, I went to the site because I wanted to learn a little bit more about, you know, sort of what you guys say you do. And it was, it said strategic positioning as a service. Uh, tell us what that means. Yeah. So for most founders, the stage we come in at is somebody's made an inbound call and they're like, what do we do? And the answer is, well, 
if you only have one buyer, the answer is you're not going to get a great price. Yeah, right? let's clarify so that. You, you, you're saying that someone has received an unsolicited offer and now they're like, oh, shoot, I need to create competition. Or even just in inbound interest, right? Oh. So it's like some associate has said, called and said, hey, I see you guys. Would you be interested in selling? Um, and then we, as a founder, we get past the flattery of like, <laughs> I've finally been recognized for all my work, right? And then you're like, oh, crap, what do I need to do to figure out if I am ready to sell? Yeah. So, so that's the positioning part is really helping you understand like, what do I need to do to align the, the business to get it ready to sell? So if your business is super profitable, congratulations. Um, you've been paying yourself $74,000 a year because that's kind of like the minimum threshold the IRS won't bother you about. And you've taken distributions and taking, you've tax advantaged how you manage your cash. We'll probably want to change that before you sell it. Yeah. Right. So how you structure it, how you position it, what's your product roadmap, right? Whoever's going to buy you really wants to know, like, are we buying or do you want to stay with the business? Do you want to go? Does your product fit into our product roadmap? So there's, there's some positioning that needs to happen to get you ready to sell. The other, we kind of obfuscate a little bit because people are like, oh, you do sell side M&A. And I'm like, well, we do more than that because we have to help the founder get ready to sell before. I think one of the flaws in this process, David, and you know, because you've experienced it as well, is that broker dealers will come to you and they're like, they'll make up a really nice book for you. And then they'll tote you around and like a real estate agent, some real estate agents, they don't care what they sell it for as long as they sell it Yeah, and they get the commission. We actually think about it from a founder perspective and say, how do we help you sell it for the most you can sell it for, which are two different things. And part of that, you know, from a business development standpoint says, if you have a logical relationship with your upmarket buyer, they're probably going to be the people who buy you. So how do we help them, you know, strategically make sure that they're really, really committed to you so that when we bring in an alternate buyer, they're like, we don't want you to go to those guys because we really need you. Like, and that's relationship based and it takes some time to do. Um, but that's the fun part, right? It, it's as an investor, it's fun to, to see checks get wired into your business account as the founder. The best thing is getting the check wired to your personal account. Yeah. yeah you know what? I would imagine it's the best uh, thing. I mean, certainly I've had some exits. So um, from that standpoint, I can validate it. It's always nice to see that happen. But there is an emotional side of selling. Um, oh my god, for you know, sure! I, I'd love to actually hear, as a result of your own experience. I mean, you've you've sold many businesses. Uh, tell us a little bit about what that emotional journey looks like, and then what would you sort of suggest anyone do to prepare for that moment? I think the first one was the weirdest one because we're 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 we've done, we've closed. I'm sitting with the the sell side advisor who's doing what we were just talking about. He, he was doing for me at the time, Paul. And we were sitting and having dim sum. And he said, what are you going to do next? And I'm like, oh my God, I don't actually know. Because I haven't had a job in a really long time, right? So so I'm going to work for the company. By the way, it's the first time I ever got fired, by the way. It was from the, the company who bought us, bought my first company. Um, so I actually took a break, um, drove to Colorado to, to hang out and decompress and but part of the number one thing was weird is that, you know, I, me and the CEO of my first company were like, we're together, right? So when you pull those two things apart, you're like, huh, identity challenge. <laughs> Cause you're like, I'm not the CEO of this anymore. Um, and then the buyer actually uh, sent me on vacation for two months cause they wanted to recruit the team without me. So uh, I came home on like a Tuesday and my wife was like, why are you home? Right. It's way pre COVID. And I'm like, they sent me on a, on vacation. So like the next week we went on an international trip and took a vacation and all the, all the stuff, you know, from the craziness of doing a startup, right? Cause you're working 60 hours a week and making payroll and all the stuff that stresses you out. So yeah, so the identity component of it is interesting. And then, you know, I think one of the, you know, we're like, oh, the first one was cool. So let's do it again, right? Which, and I, I've seen some people are like, oh my God, it just, it's, you know, magic in a bottle. I don't want to touch it, right? Um, so, you know, dabble in investments and, you know, try to try to day trade and see how much money you lose. And there's some things I recognize now that I'm just not good at, right? I'm, I'm smart in particular categories and I know things of particular depth, but my experience as an early angel investor coming out of that was I invested in stuff I didn't understand and I lost money. And I was like, huh, I wonder why that happened. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots around the identity and, and thinking through it. I think the other thing that some of your listeners will grok is, uh, Many of us do what we do for our father's approval. 
and we have a chip on our shoulder and there's a lot of people who have a chip on their shoulder for lots of different reasons, not just dad. I'm not blaming dads. Um, I'm just saying for me, right. There was the, the, like, I want approval. And at the end of the day, I realized I was never going to get it. And for a while that caused a really interesting, like reflection around like, wow, what, what's the thing that drives me now? Yeah. Right. And um, I have obviously processed through this enough with years of therapy, relatively speaking, <laughs> to be able to not have it be an emotional spot. But, you know, I think one of the things for founders is we look at it and we're like, this thing has been driving me a long time. I may not like it, but I'm comfortable with it because I know it. Yeah. And then it disappears and you're like, what's my motivation? Right. Yeah. I feel like a, maybe, you know, a Hollywood movie star, you're like, I want to know my motivation for this part. And then losing that motivation for a while was kind of weird. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's funny. I, most entrepreneurs that I know that have been very successful have a chip on their shoulder. You say dad, and I'm going to use air quotes here, but um, you know, dad can be metaphoric for a spouse, uh, a parent, um, the way I was treated in school. It just, yeah, a single like- single mom on food stamps, right? I mean, whatever the whatever the thing is that caused that 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 vow or that uh, that chip. Um, hey, use it as long as you can. Also, recognize it's probably not healthy and you need some help. Totally. Fearless Fund. We talked about this, or you you mentioned this earlier. I, I talked about it in the the um, um, introduction. Um, mm-hmm. Most people on here are probably not going to be familiar with them, but Fearless Fund invests in women of color uh, led early stage businesses. And and as I I pulled up their site, the mission is to bridge the gap in venture funding for women of color, building scalable um, growth uh, companies. How did you get involved with them, and 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 what are you doing to sort of support them today? Yeah. Um, so about 10 years ago, I met a guy in Atlanta called Rodney Sampson and Rodney was part of Startup America. So Startup America and Startup Weekend merged to form Up Global. And so I've known Rodney for about a decade and I've done a bunch of programming, the book programming and content we do is workshops, um, particularly around um, BIPOC and founders of color and, and trying to really provide more access to programming to that group because it's had historically hasn't had as much access. Um, there's a lot of, you know, white dudes named Dave who, you know, have plenty of access to startup stuff. Um, not about you. This is just about me. Yeah, so, yeah, um, so yeah, so I did a seminar for them. Rodney recommended me to him. I did a seminar for him and it was actually how startups make money and not become a statistic. So there's a hour seminar we do about what are the 14 revenue models and how do you think about it? And, uh, two weeks went by afterwards and we did about 270 women of color were on the first event and about 60 were on the, the office hours. And then a couple of weeks went by and they said, hey, the principals would like to meet you. I'm like, sure. They didn't say what they want to meet me about. And about three minutes in, David, we're like, oh my God, this is an interview. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm super flattered, but I'm not really, I'm not really employable in the traditional sense. And they had a chance to share their vision and what they're working on and the, the, the my most founded, least funded angle there. So here's the quick math. And I, I wish I had written down the statistics because it, I don't have it off the top of my head. But over the last 20 years, 3.1% of all venture capital has gone to white dudes named Dave. Now, gyms are the problem. They're 3.4%. All women, 28 2.9%, all women. 0.8% people of color. There's not even a statistic for women of color over the last 20 years. It's so small. So from a mission perspective, I'm like, you know, actually, if I can, in the next 10 years of my career, if I can help change the math in that area by being an an ally and a fan, um, I'm in, right? So super excited about it. The fund's been, um, they're investing in really interesting things. I would tell you half of the fund is CPG, consumer packaged goods, not my lane. Um, I'm learning it as fast as I can. And I, I love to be a quick study and learn. Uh, half the fun is technology. Totally feels like it's my lane. Um, but understanding the community and the culture and the people and really meeting the founders where they are. And I'd say for the most part, it's been super fun. For There's sometimes where, you know, I recognize, not sometimes, I genuinely recognize my privilege, but I also recognize sometimes where those, you know, people like, oh, Mike, don't you think people are just being sensitive calling it a microaggression? I'm like, no, actually, it's legitimately a microaggression, right? And I've seen that reflected back as I try to be more accessible to to founders and those things have been good lessons learned hard, right? There's times where you're like, I don't know that I want that negative feedback. But the answer is, no, no, no. That's actually, that's what's required. Yeah, That's what's required of us as learners, 
right, to be to be aggressive about that. So super excited about what the fund's working on. Uh, we're at the end of Fund One. We'll have our first um, first uh, our final check coming out of Fund One, and we've we've started in looking at Fund Two. Our our goal there is 150 million dollars. Um, Arian's amazing. Ayana's amazing. The team's great. So they're um, it, you know, it's it's been interesting because I'm I'm a senior partner with the fund, but I won't be a general partner. And the reason is, is it's for us and by us for women of color. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? That's awesome. And I'm super happy being a senior partner and supporting that effort. So I think the 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 one trend for me of I don't have to sit in the left hand chair anymore on the airplane. I'm happy to be in the right hand chair. Right. Um, I don't have to be CEO. I'm happy to be COO. I don't have to be the founding partner. I'm happy to support the founding partners. And that's a career spot I think I'm I'm happy with and content with. Um, it's fun, and then it's it's fun to focus on scale. Like how do we really scale this in a meaningful way? And and those are the things that I think I'm good at. But I don't have to do it from a uh, getting necessarily praise and recognition. It's more about getting the job done. Yeah, it's leading from behind. I think that's great that you're working on this. Uh, the numbers are staggeringly low. I guess I didn't realize how how little uh, went to just even women as a broader category. Um, and in fact, all, most of the data that I've read shows that women operated businesses are more successful than men operated businesses. And so that's, uh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Again, you're back to the same access to capital topic. Yeah. If I don't have access to capital based on geography or based on, uh, let's call it what it is, systematic racism, right? So networks are open for people who have access to the network. Right. So one of the things that we try to do is we it's hard to give feedback in the moment. Sometimes we it, we want to give measured feedback. So we try to give measured feedback in, around market team traction and product. There's lots of other feedback we can give, too. But again, it doesn't matter so much. But, you know, VCs are bad at ghosting people and not providing any feedback because as a VC, you're like, there's no upside to giving feedback. Right. If I if I give you feedback, and you're like, ah, I don't like what Dave said. And you crush it, you're never going to come back to me again and say, hey, do you want to invest again? Right? Because yeah. I told you, I gave you candid feedback. So there's no upside in it for the VCs. The drawback is the, the community we serve deserves feedback, right? So it's hard and we're trying to figure out that I would say I'm trying to figure out the balance. I don't, I think maybe other team member, members have done a better job of it, but yeah, no, I think it's for all founders, if, you know, like we started at the beginning, there's a thousand things that can kill you in the startup. If you can show me a shortcut or the cheat code to get from this level to that level in the video game, and I don't have to spend six hours getting killed by the same boss, like that's rad. I should, I want one. Give me that. <laughs> right. Well, let's uh, let's transition to people for just a second. I mean, we talked, mm -hmm. you know, we've talked about uh, pricing, revenue, business models. Let's talk about people because it's an interesting time right now. I, I literally can't talk to an entrepreneur today without hearing their concerns about talent and they're saying, you know, I can't find people, but if they can, they're struggling to afford them. If they try, they're struggling to retain them. So what are your thoughts on the labor market today? And when you're talking to these startups and, you know, you guys are thinking about funding these new businesses, like how are you, how are you sort of working with them to think about uh, talent as they go forward? Well, I mean, in, in the startup phases, obviously it is your number one expense, right? We may call it engineering. We may call it customer success and sales. It's people. Right. At the end of the day, I have to be able to scale my my people. I have to know what I need for them. I have to be able to manage them. So it's the it's you know, it's the good and the bad. The good thing is is um I know what I need. The bad thing is people are involved and that's not, not always easy. So the the pieces there, I think, is again, I won't dig into to the, the culture component because I think it's such a broad topic. Right now you need to think about your values and what's important to you from a value standpoint and do the people align with your values. If you get that out of the way in the early stage, you'll be fine. Like we can fix culture later. So, and then you have to look at my cost, right? What's my my cost of the person? What are the economics? How long does it take me to hire them? How long does it take me to onboard them and train them? One of the common mistakes in, in startup land is you, you hire the best you can afford early days, right? And then I'll, I'll, I can't tell the number of times founders like, we have technical debt. I'm like, that's awesome. Congratulations. Six months from now, you will have organizational debt <laughs> because or because it follows, right? There's yeah. technical debt first. You're like, oh, we didn't build this right. And then you have organizational debt, which is I have some people that I started with in the early days and they're, they're not really the right people, yeah. but they're founders or co-founders or early first employees. 
And I, I, you got to make some hard decisions, right? So I think when you think about a scalable people process, right, that that's really important because as a founder, I would tell you my, in my first company, we went from zero to 32 million in sales and zero to 150 people in about four years and pretty much made every mistake you can make, right? My, my fans would tell you I made all those mistakes. My, my detractors would tell you I made way more than that. Um, but you make a lot of mistakes, but all the, all the mistakes are generally, you know, the leading problem is people. Yeah. So identifying a process of how you scale people faster, putting the infrastructure in place so you can do it in such a way that you, you're not distracted by, you know, did the, did this happen or did that happen? Did, you know, like just things like, you know, payrolls and things like that. Automating as much of that process so you can stay, stay on the, the big things that get you to the big milestones is super important. So, you know, I think the stuff you're doing with, with Docs is super fun because it's like, you know, there's quality, you know, just like the entrepreneur story, there's quality people everywhere with different access to capital from a venture standpoint. There's also quality workers everywhere um, that, you know, you look at the material difference, you know, in the development side, it, 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 it goes like, oh, it's now Argentina, now it's Georgia. And then it's, so there's always, it's, it's not really a race to the bottom. It's a question of where do you find the quality people in a way that you can make uh, sustainable relationships for your employees, yeah, right. And uh, you know, the U.S. side of it right now, the, the job hopping and and sorry, we can't call it job hopping anymore because that's my generation and your generation. It would you know, that'd be the great resignation. But uh, um, it's not you know. Now it's all about for me as the employee, what's best for me. And I think that you know, companies haven't shown any loyalty to it. So I think if you're old school and you think about it, that is job hopping, which I said. You're, you're probably just wrong. And, you know, when employees can go make 50% some, somewhere else, the answer is you better figure that out because it's going to be a problem. Well, you know, it's funny. I must be an old soul because I still call it job hopping. Um, you know, it's funny. I was, uh, McKinsey just tried to reframe this by, they, they wrote a document called the great attrition as opposed to the great resignation. Um, it's funny because they called out three things that were really important to attracting and retaining workers. No surprise, uh, number one was flexible workforce. The ability that I don't have to work in an office 24 seven, that you're managing, managing me by objective versus uh, by site. And uh, number two was compensation. And number three was career development. And those actually, they, they sort of traded around depending on your age bracket. But in general, those were the top three things. So as people start thinking about it, something to keep in mind. Um, Dave, we're getting towards the end here. I just, one last question for you. I just, just curious, you know, a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs themselves, business leaders who are maybe thinking of becoming an entrepreneur. You know, if you were giving your 25 year old self, um, some entrepreneurial advice, uh, what would it be now looking backward? Uh, it, that's so easy. I think the first 10 years, David, I focused on learning how to run a business and then I discovered how to make money. And those are different things. So it gets back to the idea, right? I mean, as, as entrepreneurs, we fall in love with our ideas and it's a rough mistress, right? Some of our ideas aren't actually that good. Yeah. And you're like, but, but it's my, but, the, but that's the mistress I love. And I'm like, sometimes you should get, you know, get a new one, get a new idea. And I was going to say a new mistress, but get a, get a new idea because the, the amount of work required to build a non-scalable, not super exciting business and the amount of work required to build a super scalable unicorn type business, the, the workload doesn't actually vary, right? Time, the commitments, the pain and suffering. But, you know, everyone else wants somebody to say, would you come off the bench and build another startup? And I'm like, maybe. And people are like, really? I'm like, if it was a really big idea. Because what I've learned is that really big ideas are actually really rare. There's some really good ideas that are small ideas. Like there are some things that should happen because they need it to change the world but it's not a venture scale business. So for me to, to come off the consulting practice and making the money that I know how to make now and trading that for equity to go scale the company is, would I do it? Sure. Yeah, if it's the right opportunity, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be a uniquely big idea. And I think for us as founders, that's the big difference. First 10 years was I'm, work, I'm working a business that I love. And then after a while you're like, you know, I don't actually know that I love it that much. I think it was, if it was a bigger idea, I would love it more. So <laughs> fantastic. All right. Well, we've been talking to Dave Parker, the author of Trajectory Startup. Uh, Dave, where can people learn more about you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. 
um, as uh, backslash Dave Parker, because I'm not the baseball player on that one. Or you can just go to dkparker.com is my website and you can find the blog and inform, information on the book and contact info as well. Awesome. Well, Dave, thanks again for being on the show today. Always good to see you. Thank you for listening to the Future is Borderless podcast with David Nilsson. Be sure to click subscribe to future episodes so you can hear from more top entrepreneurs and thought leaders. And we'll see you again next time.